So today, we are beginning a new sermon series called The Key to More. And you just need to relax from the top. It isn't about adding more stuff to your already chaotic life. It's about being more intentional about the things that we do and about bringing more of who Christ is into what we're, we're already doing in our lives. This weekend, I'm encouraging us to be people of hope, to hope more, to hope more. And I, I need to begin by, by making sure we're all on the same page with this word hope. It's a word we use all the time, right? Man, I hope my raggedy car cranks in the morning. I, <laughs> I hope my team wins this ball game. Uh, I, I hope I catch this plane. I, I, I hope this marriage works. I mean, that's the way we generally use the word, right? It's, it's, the, way, it's the way I mostly use it. It's, it's a desire. It's a, it's, a, it's a wish, really. That is not our definition of hope today. In Romans 15, Paul writes these words. May God, the source of hope, May God, the source of hope, fill you with joy and peace through your faith in him. Then you'll overflow with hope. So Paul is, is saying that when God fills us with joy and peace, we'll overflow with, with wishes, with uh, desire for good. No, I don't think so. Because here is our working definition of hope today. It is a theological definition. Hope is an expectation of God's goodness. It is an expectation of God's goodness. An expectation based not on wishes, based not on luck, but on the faithful character of God. I, I looked something up on, on a wilderness survival site this week. And for the record, record, I'm much more indoorsy than outdoorsy, okay? But this wilderness survival site listed something they called the rules of three. Have you ever heard this? The rules of three. Wilderness survivalists say you can go about three weeks without food. They claim you can go about three days without water. They contend that the average person can go about three minutes without air. Interesting, interesting facts. Now let me, let me add this to the list. I'm not sure you can go three seconds without hope. I've come to believe that hope is, is one of the essentials of life. Pearl S. Buck, a novelist of note from a previous century, wrote these words, to eat bread without hope is still slowly to starve to death. I love this clip we're about to watch from Shawshank Redemption. Watch this. Nice grow. You, you couldn't play something good, huh? Hank Williams or something? They broke the door down before I could take requests. Was it worth it? <laughs> Two weeks in the hall? Easiest time I ever did. There's no such thing as easy time in the hall. That's right. A week in the hall is like a year. I had Mr. Mozart to keep me company. <laughs> so they let you tote that record player down there, huh? He's in here. In, in here. That's the beauty of music. They can't get that from you. Haven't you ever felt that way about music? Well, I played a mean harmonica as a younger man. Lost interest in it, though. Didn't make much sense in here. Here's where it makes the most sense. You need it so you don't forget. Forget? Yeah, for forget the... There are places in the world that aren't made out of stone, that there's a, there's something inside that they can't get to, that they, they can't touch. It's yours. What are you talking about? Hope. Hope. Dr. Harold Wolf, who was a professor at Cornell University's medical school, did a study on the effects of hope on the human body. He, he studied 25,000 prisoners of war over an extended period of time to see what hope did for them and what difference it made in their lives. He discovered 
that out of those 25,000 POWs, there was one group of individuals on whom the experience of being a POW had very little effect at all. In spite of the brutality, in spite of the solitary confinement, in, in spite of all kinds of inhumane abuse, there was one group. It just didn't much phase. There was no post-traumatic stress disorder. They didn't get terribly ill. They didn't have flashbacks. They, they handled it and went on with their life. And when he studied that group, the one common denominator was an extraordinary high level of hope. Hope makes all the difference in the world. It is essential for handling the crises of life. In his concluding study, Dr. Wolf said this, when a man has hope, he's capable of bearing incredible burdens and cruel punishment. But when hope is gone, people fall apart emotionally, physically, and spiritually. You know, I'm afraid that hope may be in short supply in our world today, and so people begin to place their hope in all sorts of things. They often actually put their hope in false hope. They put their hope in things like financial security. They put their hope in their own wisdom or abilities. They put their hope in political parties. And of course, inevitably, these things disappoint, and actually, people end up being worse off. Because nothing is worse than being disappointed by a false hope. So the question for all of us is this. Is there any place that I can get hope that I can depend upon, that I can count on for the crises of life? Where do I find that kind of hope? Well, the Bible tells you that you find it in God. That God is the source, the source of hope. That verse we just looked at from Romans 15 said as much, did it not? May God, the source of hope, fill you with joy and peace through your faith in him. And then he says these words, then you will overflow with hope. You know, there are a lot of things in life that I can't count on. A lot of things in life that are uncertain. Let me give you three anchors of the soul today. Things that we can count on so that no matter what happens, we know that life is not hopeless. So where exactly do you find hope? Well, first of all, you find hope in God's presence with you. You find hope in God's presence with you. As I said, there are a lot of uncertainties in life. One of the sad uncertainties of life is that people will leave you. Friends and family might move away. There will be people who you love who will die. There will be people who you love who will become ill and, 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 and won't be themselves anymore. There may even be those who you have conflict with and there's this separation that is painful. The sad truth of life is that people leave us. But the true certainty of life is that God will never leave you. Even in our darkest moments, he is with us. I had a friend lose a son in an airplane accident, and in his pain and in his great confusion, the dad asked me a very legitimate question. Where was God when that plane was going down? You know what I said? I said, he was right there with your son. He was with your son every moment. But see, God is not just a presence He's a guide as well. Psalm 32 verse 8 says this. I will guide you along the best pathway for your life. I will advise you and watch over you. One of the great things that brings hope to me is realizing that I don't have to figure it all out. I just have to trust the God who, is it all, who has it all figured out. He knows and he understands and he's willing to guide and advise me through life. I love this verse. From Lamentations, Jeremiah writes these words. I have hope when I think of this. I have hope. The Lord's love never ends. His mercies never stop. They are new every morning. Many of us look back on our lives and say, man, I really blew it there, man. I wish I had never made that mistake. 
we feel hopeless because we feel like we've already messed everything all up. This passage says that God gives us a new, fresh start every morning. His mercies never stop. They're new every morning. I need that. I need the hope of that. That God gives me a new start and a new day to live a new hope that he wants to give to me. And not only is God present and willing to guide us, but let me tell you this, he ain't going nowhere either. This is God talking to Isaiah in Isaiah 46. God says, listen to me. I have carried you since you were born. I have taken care of you from your birth. Even when you are old, I will be the same. Even when your hair has turned gray, I will take care of you. Man, that's a hallelujah for me, I'll tell you that much. <laughs> I made you and will take care of you. I will carry you and save you. Can you compare me to anyone? No one is equal to me or like me. Wow. You find hope in God's presence with you. You also find hope in God's purpose for you. In God's purpose for you. You ever been lost? I mean, I mean, I mean really lost. When I, when I was at Fuller Seminary, and this was, this was pre-GPS days, I spent my first two weeks in L.A. totally lost. I was a complete mess. I had maps all over the passenger seat. I didn't understand the freeway system. All the communities were foreign to me. It was super frustrating to me. Some of us feel lost in regard to our purpose in life. Where are we headed? Where are we going? Today I want us to realize that no matter what's happening in our lives, the good, the bad, or the super ugly, God's purpose is working in us. God is doing good things in my life even when the situation is bad, even when I don't feel it, even when it doesn't make any sense. When the situation is bad, he's still doing good things in my life. I want us to look at a couple of verses that we've looked at many times here at Hope. We keep coming back to these verses because they're so profound. They really help explain what life is all about. The first one is Romans 8, verse 28. Paul writes, we know that God causes all things to work together for good. For those who love God and are called according to his purpose. We know that God causes all things, all things to work together for good. For those who love God and are called according to his purpose. Now notice what that verse does not say. It doesn't say all things work out the way I want them to. Now we would love for it to say that. We'd like to interpret it that way, but that's not what it says. It doesn't say all things work out the way I want them to work out. It also doesn't say all things are good. It doesn't say all things are good. There can be some horrible things that happen to us in our lives. Horrible. Not all things in your life are good. But this passage says that God can make anything, the good stuff and the bad stuff, work together for good. It's like baking a cake. There's, there's some tasty things that go into a cake, right? Sugar, butter, and milk. I love those things. A spoonful of any of those things would be tasty. But if you're going to bake a cake, you need other things. How about a spoonful of raw eggs? How about, how about that? A spoonful of baking powder. A spoonful of flour. How about a nice swig of vanilla extract? How about that? <laughs> Put all that stuff together. The tasty stuff and the nasty stuff. And it produces a cake. And the cake is what? It's good. God wants to take the elements in your life, even the things that are distasteful, the things that are bitter, the things that are, have been horrible for you, and he wants to make them work together for the good. And you know God can do that. Can, can God bring good out of bad? Did he bring any good out of the crucifixion? I'd sure say so. The crucifixion did not look good at the time, did it? It looked devastating. But God brought good out of it. Those of us who are Jesus followers live under the roof of God's grace. 
And just like living under the roof of my own home, not everything is always perfect under that roof. But those of us who are Jesus followers are under God's roof. And he tells us that he will cause all things to work together for the good, even the difficult, even the bad. And so this morning, if you're here and you're facing an impossible situation, you have an ingredient in your life that is horribly bitter. This next verse is for you. Again, it's a passage that we love around here in Jeremiah 29, 11. God says, I have good plans for you, not plans to hurt you. I will give you hope and a good future. You may think that what God is allowing in your life right now is painful and it is to no avail, but God says, my plan ultimately is good. You just don't see it all. God says, you need to trust me. You need to have a hope because it's a plan to give you hope and a future. And man, I love this passage too. Paul says in Philippians 1, God began doing a good work in you, and I am sure he will continue it until it is finished when Jesus Christ comes again. God starts something in your life, and what he starts, let me tell you, he finishes. You may say you're too far beyond hope. You're not. You're not because God finishes what he starts. And here's ultimately what the finish looks like, by the way, the grand finish in 1 Peter 1. God has reserved for his children the priceless gift of eternal life. It is kept in heaven for you. And God in his mighty power will make sure that you get there safely to receive it because you are trusting him. So be truly glad. There's wonderful joy ahead even though the going is rough for a while down here. Now, let me pull up for just a minute here and say something that's important. If you find yourself in a situation right now that is abusive or dangerous because somebody's taking advantage of you, don't look at that situation and say automatically, this is just part of that delicious cake God is baking with my life. No. Now, God can restore you from the bad things that have happened in your life, but also God also wants to see you protected as well. If you are in one of those situations, I plead with you to get some help. And I plead with you to do it now. So when you focus on the fact that God's presence is watching over you, God's purpose is working in you, you're going to begin to have hope. But that's not all. There's a third source of hope, and it's this. You find hope in God's power within you. You find hope with God's power within you. Last week we celebrated the resurrection of Jesus Christ where God proved that Jesus was who he said he was by raising him from the dead. And if God can raise Jesus from the dead, you know what? He can raise a dead marriage too. He can raise a dead career. He can raise a dead dream. He can raise a dead hope. There is hope. And here, here's the most amazing reality of this life as a Jesus follower. I still don't fully comprehend it. God has left us with a power within us. A power within us. Rufus spoke about it a bit last weekend. Because Jesus said to his disciples, because you have believed without seeing, you will do the same works. He's talking really about us when he speaks to his disciples. He says, because you have believed without seeing, you will do the same works I've done, and even greater works. He'll say, you'll do, you'll do greater things than what I was able to do on this, on this planet. See, that's, that's not from us. That's from God's power within us. Isaiah 41.10 says this, don't worry because I'm with you. God says, don't be afraid because I'm your God. He says, I will make you strong and will help you. I will support you. If you've just been barely hanging on, if your hope is diminished today, let me encourage you to think about these three things we've talked about today. To remember the presence of God, that he's always with you, 
that you will never be without him. You may not feel it, but he is there. He is aware. He cares. He can help. You remember God's presence. You will never go through anything alone. That's not me saying it. It's God saying it. Secondly, you need to remember God totally has a purpose for you. He totally has a purpose for you. He didn't make you for nothing. And everything that occurs in your life, the good and the bad, God can work for the purpose of good. That is not me talking. That is God talking. And thirdly, you need to remember that you are sitting on some power that God has promised you and you may be totally unaware of. Check this out in Isaiah 40. This is one of my favorite verses of all time. Those who hope in the Lord. Those who hope in the Lord will renew their strength. They will soar on wings like eagles. They will run and not grow weary. They will walk and not be faint. You don't feel like you're soaring today. You're just barely crawling today. God doesn't want you to live like that. There are a lot of things in life that are uncertain, but these three things you can count on. They are certainties of life. No matter what happens, God's presence will always be watching over you. God's purpose will always be working in you. And God's power is poised to be released in you. Because see, no situation is hopeless. Let me close with a little... Hope family story, if you'll allow me. In 1988, Craig Strickland, our founding pastor, and a small group of Jesus followers gathered over several weeks to discuss the planting of a new and different kind of church in Cordova. There were all, all sorts of things to decide, but one of the most important decisions was the decision of what to name, what to name the church. Now, Craig, of course, had his idea for a name, but he wisely chose to open up the naming process to the, to the whole group. Because, see, this church, whatever it was going to be called, was not going to be successful without the buy-in of the 20 or so people in that room at that time. So one, one fateful day, the finalization process for the naming of the church began. And with, with the use of a good old-fashioned flip chart, the group voted on a list of church names. Now, I will also say this. They also had a, had a phone book there. Y'all remember a phone book? <laughs> they used to leave them on my front porch. Uh, they had a phone book there because they wanted to make sure that there weren't 50 other churches named the exact same thing that they were thinking. Well, the group voted on, on a list of church names, and from that list, some number of names would make it to the, to the next round. Craig's name, by the way, It never made it to the final four. <laughs> but he was okay with it. Because the winning name was Hope. And I was told yesterday by a good friend of mine that there really wasn't a close second. So this whole idea of hoping more is part of our DNA here. And with God's help, and God's encouragement, and God's presence, and purpose, and power. We're going to keep it that way. Let's pray together. Father God, uh, I, I, I feel for those today who are here, and although they've heard this message, uh, they're not there yet because they are hopeless. Father, something has occurred in their lives that has been so devastating that they can't begin to wrap their brain around how tomorrow's going to look. Father, I pray for all of us here today that we might understand the hope that we have in you. That him, my hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. Father, may we understand that truth. May we not see hope as something we might wish for, some desire we might have in our heart. 
Father, we might see it for what it is theologically, an expectation of your goodness. And Father, we are humbled by your goodness today. And so we at Hope Church celebrate a God who loves us like that. We pray in the strong name of Jesus. Amen. Stand, if you will, for the benediction. Now may the God of peace give you peace at all times and in every way in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Hope more this week, okay? We love you. We'll see you next week. God bless.